So today I want to talk about testing and debugging. Um, two very important tasks. It, as you know, developing software, whether for um, data analysis or more generally, you'll spend a lot of time um, trying to find bugs and testing is one way to try to cut down on the amount of time that you're spending looking for bugs. Also, you know, software testing is really the way in which you make sure that um, the results you're getting are correct. Um, we've talked a lot in this course about how to ensure that results are reproducible. Um, really, today we're talking about how to make sure that the results are also correct. I'm kind of a relatively new convert to software testing. I had long said that I don't need tests, I have users. If, um, if there are problems in my software, a user will identify it and let me know, and then um, and, and that, so that'll be my way of, of um, identifying problems. Jenny Bryan, one of my Heroes, she, a statistician at the University of British Columbia, now you know working mostly at our studio. She says um, she has said, if you use software that lacks automated tests, you are the tests. Um, it's really it's comforting when Jenny and I agree on something, um, but. Um, Yes, you know, my, my method of testing has usually been, you know, I tried it and it worked. Um, you know, it's not like I don't test my software at all. Um, I do, you know, you write a function, you check to make sure that it's working, and then you move on to the next um, thing to do. But Hadley, Hadley Wickham has this, um, paper from a few years ago about, about testing um, our code. And he has this great quote in there. Um, it's not that we don't test our code. It's that we don't store our tests so they can be rerun automatically. And th this is really sort of a, th this comment really captures Hadley Wickham's personality really well, that he, he points out that, you know, scientific um, software developers, or, you know, in particular, statisticians that are developing software, um, they they do test our code. And he so that's sort of a positive thing. We do try out our code to make sure it works. But we can Im improve our practices by storing our tests. The tests that we do, we could store um, set up in a way that they'll be rerun automatically. And that's really the, the goal um, of today, the, or you know, most of what I'm talking about today, is how to, how to write tests for your software um, and that, that you can rerun automatically all the time, then the benefits that you'll get. You know, as as with many of the other uh, lectures in this class, I'm going to focus mostly on R. Um, but I think the main principles will apply Python just in the same way. Um, the the sp specific tools that you use for Python versus R will be quite quite different, or well, somewhat. I mean, somewhat different. Um, but that really, the idea is that I mean, you write a function, um, you check it out by con by constructing some example and making sure it's giving the right answers. Um, automated testing, you know, proper testing of software would capture that example and the test of that it, that your function is giving the right output and put it in a structure so that repeatedly gets checked every time you check the software, every time you make a change to the software, you run all those tests again. A variety of different kinds of tests that you might, con you might construct for software. Um, 
when we focus mostly on what are called unit tests that for every small function that you write um, check that it gives the right results in a set of specific cases so for each little function write some tests of if you give it this input does it give it does it give the right output um, larger tests include what what are called integration tests of sort of at a higher level check that some multifunction tasks you might be using are working you know check that the um, the small functions that you you've written are working together I would say regression tests are are an an example of that of sort of saved the results for some large um, larger task and make sure that those things continue to work as you are modifying aspects of the software one further piece that I would add to um, software testing is just the checking of inputs that conform to what you what you expect you know within each function if you include some checks that the inputs are what conforming to the, the what you're expecting um, that can s solve many problems um, that will show up in their use you know as if if you're expecting things to be a certain way and a user uses it a somewhat different way um, that would be one way that you're going to get problems and it but if you add checks of the inputs you can avoid that early on so as as an example i'm going to use this um, function windsorize which it's the 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 goal of this function is it takes an input vector of a numbers x and it has some quantile q and it will all the 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 values in x that are above that quantile or below sort of the opposite quantile or really sort of below the 0.6 percentile or above say the 99.4 percentile it will bring those in to the nearest upper and lower value so this is a simple this this function is a simple way to um, kind of robustify analysis of taking taking vectors of numbers that might have outliers and bringing those outliers in a little bit. Um, so this function, I I include some checks at the beginning. First, um, is the is the vector x that's input is it numeric, and if it's not numeric stop the function and and issue this this error message that x should be numeric and then um, a second set of checks of the other the other input q of you know look at is q numeric and is it a length one object and then is it sort of between zero and one you, you notice so I've thoroughly tested here the the two inputs X and Q and if there if X is not a vector or Q is something that's not length one or is outside the range zero to one then I'll issue warnings or or error messages and you notice here that like you know more than half of the code in this function is devoted to this bit of doing these initial checks. Um, but it, this will um, prevent a lot of problems. Like if you, you know, if someone had put Q equals six thinking or thinking that, that um, they wanted a percentage rather than a, than a proportion. There, you know, one way to try to simplify some of this code is that there's a built-in function within R called um, that's this stop if not. So rather than say, you know, if X is not numeric, then stop and issue a warning. You can use this built-in function um, stop if not that will um, sort of give a me and the error messages. The error message will not be as as clear. Um, 
it'll be you know a default message that uses this is numeric x so the user might not like the error message i mean not might not might have a harder time interpreting what the error message means but it's it's um much you know it cuts down the amount of code that we're writing and um and then particularly you can you can use with this stop if not you can have um, multiple conditions of check that q is numeric and then check that q has length one and then check that q is bigger than zero and that it's less than or equal to zero so you could put all those into one condition um save of effort in writing again i don't the error messages that come out will not be as nice as you you might as you might want the user to get, but um, if the question is between you know really easy to interpret error messages or just getting these checks into the function right away, it's probably better to go with this this approach of like something simple that produces potentially meaningful but not ideal error messages. If you understand what I mean. The, these checks of the inputs, you should write as you're writing the function. The very first time you're writing the function, you should also sit down and write these checks of the inputs. It, that's important because um, three months later, you may forget some of what, you, you may forget what, what you had intended here. It's much easier to include these checks right the first off. There's another, um, our package assert that that um, kind of enhances that um, stop it not function. It provides a number of other alternatives and another number of um, it gives you more control over um, the error the error messages. I think, and it has a, lot, a number of helper functions like. Um, here I'm using this this function in a, in the assert that package is dot number. So this checks that Q is numeric and it's numeric with a single, um, with length one. So in, in, the, in the context of an R package, I would um, include this Roxygen comment that import from, so, to, that makes these functions ensures that these functions are available. That the assert that package is is loaded, and that I can use the functions here. Um, assert that has, I mean, the using a, the assert that package here has the disadvantage that you're adding another dependency, but it has the advantage that some of the it, ha it has a number of helper functions that can make these kinds of checks of inputs a little um, less cumbersome, potentially. I've sort of gone back and forth in whether to use it or not use it, whether to just um, kind of construct these, these assertions myself directly. But so the first line of defense of um, ensuring that the functions you write are going to work properly is having them check the inputs that they are given and that they really are as expected. Um, and, you know, having thorough checks of inputs, is, you know, especially in the context of a, a cascading series of functions um, is a, you know, will, will get you to the problems, uh, you know, problems sooner than rather than later. And help help to let your users know, which could be, you know, you six months from now, that um, the user is is um, using the function in the in the way intended. But that. Um, so let's move to you know really testing that our functions are working properly, and really the best. Um, I think the, all of the ways for testing our, our code require that you put the R code within the context of an R package, as we talked about last week. One of the, the main advantages of creating an R package is that you have this, this defined structure and that, and that 
design structure allows you to create tests that you can run repeatedly. Um, sort of the basic way that R does tests of R packages are, is the, these three ways that examples that you put in the R documentation, those will get run every, every time that you check the package. Um, there won't be any checks that, that the functions are giving the right, um, giving the right uh, results, but it, ju it just runs it to see if it gives any warnings or errors. The second um, part of testing in R packages is the vignettes that you write, that those will get reconstructed every time that you, you build the package, you check the package. And again, it's not looking to see whether the, the output is correct. It's just looking to see, does it run without giving an error? And then thirdly, um, you can create a test directory in your, um, in your R package that contains a set of R scripts. And it, when you run R, when you check the package, it will run all that R code and look at the output that's obtained, and it will check that the output obtained matches some um, saved version of the file that you've created. So every R script, it'll it'll run, and it'll and if the the R script you know prints out output, it will check that the printed output matches some previously saved set of results. So the, these are all kind of primitive. Um, the first two things, just looking to see whether the examples run without errors, whether the vignette, you know, the, the tutorials you've created run without errors. Um, and, and then the, te you know, putting scripts in the test directory and sort of expected results. Um, these are kind of regression tests sort of things, really, of checking that as you change the software that the, the, the previous results are still getting obtained. The, it, you know, including examples is hugely important. Making sure that they don't give errors is, you know, primitive, but, you know, a reasonable starting point anyway. And definitely the, you know, the first line, um, if, you know, users really look for examples to, you know, understand how to use your code. So including some examples like, you know, this one of here, I just um, take the numbers one through 20 with 10 NAs or one through 10 and 21 to 30 with 10 A's sprinkled in and then randomize it and then see what result would I get if I Windsorize at this like 20%. Um, it's not really the great example, but like sort of shows how to use the code at least. And if this were to throw an error, that would indicate a problem. Um, this test directory I've used mostly to sort of check reading in and writing out um, data. You know, I might you know, if I, in my RQTL package, I have a test that's just to, that reads in a set of data and then writes it back out again and then reads in the thing that I wrote out and makes sure that those two things match. Um, and this, the last line here, I'm um, sort of cleaning up after myself that I created a file it is um, checking that that, I mean, it is, unlink is basically removing that temporary file that I've created. But the test subdirectory, it has the event, you can include some example data in there. And um, I've used it just to check reading and writing files, that sort of thing. Really the, the recommended way to test R code is within an R package and to use this test that package that Hadley Wickham wrote um, 
which gives you a ton of great tools for making um, unit tests or larger tests of the, of the functions in your code. It provides you with a series of, of functions that kind of provide, that indicate expectations of, say you expect 10 and 10 plus, and you know, a number just a little bit above 10 to be equal, sort of equal within, the check sort of input, you know, the, the, the output and the expected output to be equal, to be exactly the same, to be kind of the same, or you expect some code to give a warning, or you expect some code to get an er give an error. It gives you a lot of helper functions like that. Um, the way that you write a test is um, using this test that function, which you give a name to the test, and then within curly braces, you provide a set of tests that use those expectations above. Um, It also uses this function context that sort of to group a set of related tests, it's basically so that in the output, um, when you when the tests get run, it sort of gives you some information about what tests it's running at the at the time. But anyway, you put all this stuff, you you store it in a in a subdirectory of that test directory. You make a subdirectory test that in your package, and within that. Um, test within this test directory, you make this test that dot r file that just says um, loads the test that library and um, does this test check of your package. Then when you run r command check, it will run all the tests that you created. So this is, um, that, all that is kind of hard to see without seeing an example, but so in a package that contains this Windsorize function, I would make a um, set of unit tests like this for my Windsorize function. At the, top of the, at the top of an R file, I would write this context Windsorize, and that's just so that then when I'm running the tests, it'll say Windsorize and then show me the result of all the tests for the Windsorize function. And then I'll have batches of calls to test that with some um, character string that's just describing the set of tests. And then these curly braces, the start and the stop and all the tests that I'm running. So I create some data. I um, create what I expect the results to be if I Windsorize at point one, what I expect the results to be if I Windsorize at point two, and then I give these um, two calls to this expect identical thing that does Windsorize X equal X at point one give me the same result as um, that value above. Um, which if you look really closely is taking the 10 and making it nine and taking the, the zero and making it one. You know, in the second case it does, it takes the, the, the 10 and makes it eight, the nine and makes it eight. You know, so I have, you know, a given input and what I expect the result to be and this test that um, business makes this structure to, to run the test and then when I, so when I run our command check to check the package, it will also run all of these tests and it will run them, you know, ex sort of explicitly. Each of these make sure that when I run Windsorize X.1 that it really is the result. You know, the, these sort of tests here, you know, I make a vector and I try it out a couple ways. Those are what, you know, what, what we all sort of do to make sure that the functions we create really are working. We create a function and then we try it out on some data and look at the output and make sure that the output is as we expected. Um, the, 
the test that package makes it so that we store these tests and then every time we run our command check they get run and all the all these tests get run and we get um, error messages shown if any of them are not working so that this is um, I was slow to go to this because it seems like a lot of work to make these tests but long term it really leads you to um, have more confidence that your code is actually working and any bugs that show up in changes that you're making to your code you find them much more quickly all the tests that you've created you just gradually build up so that every time you every time you make a change to your package you run all these tests all at once and so any change any change you make to to your code you get you get to find out what implications it has right away here's a, a second example that we might have for this Windsorize function make sh to see, you know see if it works for a really long vector so I start by creating some data um, it's it's useful to to use set seed um, since I'm going to make some random data just to make sure that the random data I'm getting is exactly the same every time so I simulate some um, standard normal data I add in some amount of missing data and then kind of here I'm sort of doing the hard sort of redoing the calculation sort of directly um, and then well I, mean, I guess I'm running Windsor Rise and then I'm sort of reconstructing it directly and making sure that it works um, I would say you know that the check the tests of this Windsor Rise function end up being a lot more code than the Windsorize function it's but um, and it, it may be overkill here but the, oh, you know long term writing tests of your code um, in, in a variety of different ways really helps you to find bugs sooner rather than later um, and gives you more confidence as you're making changes to software the, the basic workflow is to write these tests as you're coding it's as you're writing the function it's when you really have the best understanding of what the expected output should be you know if you come back to the code three months later you have to really work a bit harder to remind yourself what are the kinds of inputs to expect and what are the outputs that would correspond it's when you're writing the function that you, that that is most fresh in your mind and so that's when you should write these tests um, in R, the, the, the dev tools package has this function test that run all of the test that tests. You can also um, use this function auto test that will, anytime you make any change to the functions in R, in your R subdirectory of your package, it'll run all the tests in the test subdirectory. Just like any you you whenever you save when you're making some changes to R, you save it, it'll run all those tests and give you feedback immediately on whether they're working or not. Um, but periodically I would also, you know, when when I've finished a bunch of tests or finished a bunch of new, you know, trying to implement some new um, feature, I would, you know, run this R command check to see if um, you know to run all those tests automatically um, but so you can't you can't test every possible input so you have to make some choices of what to test what which of the tests are you gonna what things are you gonna try to test and generally the rule is to focus on boundaries that's where um, most problems end up happening of 
say the input is has just length one or just length zero, where the input has all the values exactly the same, or all the values are missing. Um, that sort of thing. Um, th th those are the cases that you, you mostly want to focus on, you know, really, you know, the unusual cases um, that, you know, whether the function is handling missing values or um, ints and minus ints properly, those are the, the, the kinds of tests to write first. I would, you know, start by just some normal test. Here's some normal data. Doesn't give the right answer. Start that as sort of your your first test, and then start adding um, you know, sort of absurdities like you know a null vector as the input, and make sure that it's handling that properly. You can also potentially con you know automate the whole construction of test cases of you know create some table of inputs and outputs, and then and then um, loop over them in your tests to you know help to because because the this test code off is really ugly and cumbersome and painful to write it's much more painful than anything else you might do anything you can do to automate it or, or simplify the process of getting through all the tests that you want to write um, is it is is worth trying Give one more example of this test that test. Um, so that I have a function in my in my Broman package that gives a, this running mean. You can also use to give a get a running median or a running SD. So basically, it's you take some big vector and it slides along that vector with some window size and looks to see and and within each window calculates the mean or the median or the SD. Um, and here, just as a check, I'm giving it, I'm s simulating a vector of, of normal data. Um, but in this particular case, I'm assuming, so I, I mean, I'm doing a running mean of some output value so that X is the kind of the the response value at some set of x's, the position, sort of position where that's that thing is measured. Um, and here I'm checking whether, you know, when if um, I'm doing a running mean over just one position, really. Does it give the right answers in that case? And as a second check, I'm I have a set of positions, um, but the 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 responses are all exactly the same. The, the first time I talked about testing, I used this as an example. And um, th this and the, the running SD here gave an, gave an error that it, it was giving a, a missing value in this case that the, that the output was all zero. And that was because something like, um, that you know the SD should be strictly zero, but it was take it was getting something that was that was you know s slightly negative, and then taking the square root of it, and I was getting a I was um, getting a bad value here. Um, and it was really only in constructing this test for giving a talk about testing that I found this flaw in my running mean function, which is a sort of what we're going for. But this, so th this points to kind of a simple example of boundary conditions to think about. So the, the running mean I'm taking, you know, looking at, um, you know, a position like this and some output value, and I can either make the position all exactly the same or I can make the output all exactly the same. But those would be examples of, um, you know, a boundary kind of case for for the inputs here. It, 
it, having con if you if you constructed your R package and put it on GitHub, there's this website called Travis CI that um, CI stands for Continuous Integration, sort of a computer sciencey term for every time that you make a change to the software, you run all your tests. So that if you you can create an account on this um, at this website and give it permission to watch your GitHub repository, and then if you once you do that. If you, every time that you push a change to your package to GitHub, Travis CI will notice that you've pushed a change. It'll it'll grab your R package from GitHub and run all your tests on it. It actually will install R, install your package, install all dependent packages, and then run all your tests. And it'll send you an email telling you what happened. This, this is... Um, really been awesome for um, sort of automa fully automating the whole testing process for my R code that I construct these, you know, I, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of work writing the code. It's a lot of work constructing the tests of all the functions. But having done that, sort of every time I make a change to code and I push it to GitHub, Travis CI grabs it and runs all the tests for me. And it's sort of remarkable that the thing is free and it's able to do this so quickly. Um, I point here to a blog post about how to use this, but um, you know, we we use this um, we used the use this package to construct our packages. Um, that the use this package has a use underscore Travis uh, function that if you run that, it will add the necessary stuff in your R package that you need to work with it on um, Travis. You need to go to this travisci.org website and sort of um, log in and then have it find your GitHub packages and you need to s indicate that, they're, um, that they should be checked, um, that they, to have Travis watch for them. And that, this blog post sort of steers you through that process, but having you know done that, then every time you push your pack, every time you push a change to your package on GitHub, it'll um, it'll run all the checks and make sure that it they're they're and give you an email if any of them failed. Let, let me just quickly show um, in our studio how how this how this can work. Um, I'm going to, th this is not really the recommended way to do this, but um, I tend not to use RStudio very much, but I'm going to jump to the directory that contains my Broman package. So I'm in the directory where my, my Broman package is. If I run this test function in parentheses, It will load the package and then it runs through all the tests it, that I, I've created in that package. Um, you know, each for each group of tests, I have you know this context and with a um, a little bit of um, of an explanation of what tests it's running. So for does the function crans pick out the names of 
of CRANs correctly. It, there are 22 tests within that file, that context, and it runs all of those. And it tells me that um, all 24 of them passed. If any of them had failed where the, the input didn't match the, ex, the, I mean, the output of the function didn't match what I expected the output to be, I would get some errors coming down here where it would show what, um, what the problems were. But so, you know, as I'm developing a package, I can run this test and run all the tests and it will, it, it will start to show me where errors are showing up. But then further, um, if I make a change to my, I, because I've set this up to work with Travis, anytime I make a change to the package and push it to GitHub, Travis will see that I've made a, that I've um, pushed the package to GitHub. It will grab the package, um, install it, run all the tests and send me an email if any, if any errors are showing up. Um, and make, maybe I can, let's also look at what, what I would see on Travis. So if I go to Travis and I go to um, K Broman, it will show all of my packages and you know what was the last build and what happened. So if I if I look at one of these, it will show this is the the last push that I made, and it gives the the out it it is when I pushed it to GitHub, it installed R, installed the package check the package and I'll get the output of that R command check, um, including toward the bottom, it, it'll say it's running the test that tests. So if any of the test that tests that I've made in here through an error, it would, um, I would get an email saying that there was an error. But this, um, Test that and Travis together have been hugely valuable for me for um, help find you know finding errors sooner. Let's turn to the topic of debugging. Sort of the 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 dual to testing is. And so we, I mean, we write tests to make sure the software, our software is giving the right answers. Um, debugging is really, we discovered that our, that our software is not giving the right answers and we want to figure out what went wrong. Um, the more, more, the sooner, you, the more completely you write tests of software, the less time you should be spending debugging. There are a variety of different tools for debugging, um, for finding bugs. The um, tried and to, true approach really is to just, um, you've identified a, a part of your code that's giving problems, like just add a bunch of print statements, sort of printing out what's going on so you can kind of get a peek at the inside of your function to see whether it's working or not. In, I would say in in R, in Python, in C, I still I this is still my main approach for trying to find bugs is just adding a bunch of print statements. Um, in R, there are a, a set of tools. Um, traceback and browser sort of key ones of if an error shows up, you can use, you can use this traceback function and it will, it will show you what were the set of calls, what, what were the set of functions that um, had been called that led to the, an error message. So that will help you to pinpoint where the problem might be. Browser is like a fancy version of a print statement. 
you put a call to this browser function within your code and run when you run your code when it hit when it hits that browser it will um, stop the code executing and and pull up um, kind of an ability to it'll um, to check what's going on. So corresponding to that, our, our studio kind of makes this even um, easier to use by um, you, you can you can add a little dot in the function that will pull up this browser, and I'll sh I'll show you how to use those in a in a second. Um, another tool that could be used for for our code is Eclipse is a you know development environment for programming, and the stat et plugin allows you to use R with this Eclipse development environment, and it has all kinds of tools for debugging. I don't, I'm aware of this as a possibility, but I don't know of anyone that uses it. And I understand it's a lot of work to set up. I've never tried it myself. Um, but if you use Eclipse for, say, Java programming, and you want to um, also use it for R programming, this would be something to look at, maybe. GDB is the, the GNU debugger. Um, it's especially useful for compiled code like C or C++ code. Um, I have not really used it that much because my it's I think harder to use in the context of sort of C++ that's called from R. Um, when I when I'm trying to debug C++ code, I'm still mostly going with you know writing adding a bunch of print statements and see what what happens. Um, let let me pause for a moment and show these R Studio breakpoints because it's a, a pretty cool um, option for for, um, for for doing debugging in R if you're using R Studio. Let's see. Um, okay, I'll go back to R Studio again. Um, again, this isn't what <laughs> this isn't what folks would recommend you to be doing. You should, if you're working with R, you should use it projects and switching between one project and another. But um, I'm just going to jump back to my play subdirectory where I have a copy of this um, this R function Windsorize. Um, you know, so I, I could you know simulate some set of data. And then run Windsorize with it. The the way in R Studio that you set breakpoints is if you if you go over here in the margin to the to the left of these line numbers, if you put um, if you if you click over there, you'll get a little red dot, and it says breakpoints will be activated when this file is sourced. So if I click source, it loads it with this debug source, um, sort of some R function. So it loads in this function with um, a breakpoint set at this position. Now when I when I run the function, so I, I have this data x. If I run that, it will step through the function and stop where I put that breakpoint. And it'll show me that I'm, it, it highlights that line with this little red, with this little green arrow. It shows me that I've stopped here. I have not yet run this line, line eight. Um, I could at this point, you know, type, what is low high? Low high is, you know, the function takes, gets the quantile of my data the, these two quantiles, Q and one minus Q. And so this is the 0.6 percentile and the 99.4 percentile. So setting a breakpoint makes it so that when I run this function, it'll stop at that breakpoint and I can sort of peruse 
what are the values that I have here? Remind myself what Q is. Q is 0 0.006. Um, it gives me some options here that I can step to the next line. So I ran, I ran this next line, which, which if, if Q is basically, if Q is bigger than a half, it'll, it'll swap the lower and, and the high break point, the low and the high quantiles to make sure that I have the lowest one here and the highest one here. And if I, pre if I hit continue, it'll run all the way to that. It'll, it'll just zip through the rest of the, the function and pop out of this browser thing. So in, in our studio, putting in this like little red dot here um, is equivalent to put, putting in, adding in a browse, a call to this browse function which when you run the function, it'll stop at that point. It'll give you this little browser where you can check um, interactively the values of different um, intermediate variables that you've, you've taken. And you can sort of step through the rest of the function one line at a time, or you can just zip out of there afterwards um, if you want. It, it, um, very useful tool for trying to um, debug our code that I recommend to you. Let me go back to the slides again. So debugging is, is you know, trying to find, I mean, you've identified that there's a problem with your code and being um, sort of savvy with different tools that will help you to narrow down where is the problem and try and try to fix it. Um, cat and print statements are the my still my main solution to the problem. But in R, this browser function and in R Studio, particularly these you know setting these breakpoints with that little red dot, um, really are the sort of a um, fancier way to make print statements that can save you a lot of time and, and headaches. Oh, and Google is probably our number one tool for trying to um, debug software that you'll often have the question of why is it doing what it's doing or what does this error message mean? Google is your first line for answering those questions of copy an error message, put it into Google and see. This almost all the time, other people have come to the same problem that you have and Google is the best way to find what solution that they came to. The, the general, I mean, you, you find that you have a problem with your code. Step one in debugging is to reproduce the problem. And, and ideally reproduce it in the, you know, try to find the minimal code that will get, that will lead to the problem. Create a reproducible example um, that, that, that displays the problem that, that you want to solve. And then turn that problem into a test. So make a test that takes your minimal example and that fails at this point, that shows this is what the input is, this is the output that I should be getting. You have a test that it's failing, and then as you're trying to fix it, you already have the test there that when the test starts passing again, you know that you're done. Um, so before you start, before you do anything else, before you poke through the code, start trying to make changes, First, um, create a reproducible example of your code and turn it into a test. The, the main strategy is to really try to isolate the problem. Where is it that things are going bad? Um, what function is it in? And which line really is the responsible 
um, bit of code. And that, you know, once you've isolated the problem, um, then the, the, your, if, if you isolate the problem to a line or a group of lines, then you're, that's when you're close to having a solution to it. And a really important principle here is, you know, don't make the same mistake twice. You identify that you've made, you know, you've, once you've, you identify the cause of your bug, you should do some like search through all the other code in your package to see, oh, I, so I screwed it up in this way here. Have I done that, made that same mistake anywhere else in your code? You see some flaw that you've introduced, look to see have you introduced it anywhere else? Because usually, um, usually bugs are things that we will do wrong repeatedly. If we do it wrong once, we're probably doing it wrong more than once. Um, and don't, I mean, while, you, while it's fresh in your mind, do, you know, search through your code to see have I made this mistake anywhere else? The worst kind of bugs are the bugs where the code is correct, but it's your thinking that's wrong. Um, because then, um, or, you know, and kind of related to that, you're, you're just mistaken about what the code is supposed to be doing. So you, you're staring at the code and it looks perfectly fine, but it's, um, you you just don't really understand what the what what R is doing or what plus is doing in this case. Um, so the the solution to this sort of situation is to um, write some little um, little test cases to just explore your understanding of what code is supposed to what what R should be doing in a particular case. Um, and I would say that you know the the, you know, the the most common problem for me is that you know I that it's the I have some idea of an algorithm that's going to work and I'm just wrong about it. So I've my code is perfectly correct, but just the algorithm that I've encoded is messed up and will never work. So it's no amount of like screwing around and improving the code is going to help if um, there's just a fundamental flaw in my understanding of um, what I should be doing or how R works. But yeah, writing trivial programs to just test your understanding um, can somehow help you out of this situation. A another Another common um, problem for me has been that um, <laughs> really remembering that it's usually it's not you that's the problem, it's me that's the problem. Often when I run into problem with code, I assume that um, my code is perfect and it's the rest of the world that's screwed up. But and I've been in this situation lots of times where I'm assuming that somebody else screwed up because surely my code is perfect. But in reality, most problems are due to me screwing things up and not to the external world. Um, I have a couple of blog posts along this lines. Um, the first one was like really emphasizing that, like I just assumed that because I was getting different results on my laptop than I got like on the server that there must be a problem with the library that I was working with. And in the second case, um, I was get, um, was getting an error, a, a warning message and just ignoring it and having some problems with the data. And I assumed that the data was screwed up, but really it was about, um, there was a warning message that I should have paid attention to, and there was a flaw in my in the code that I was using for reading it in. So, but the the basic principle here is um, I don't know about you particularly, but for me, 
if there's a problem with something I'm working on, it's usually an internal problem in my own code and not a problem with the libraries I'm using or the data. I mean, there are occasionally problems with data and libraries, but often it's just the first thing I should, before I start accusing everybody else of being messed up, I should just check to make sure that I haven't done something dumb. And, you know, the, this first example really is before accusing other people or before, you know, starting reporting bugs to in other people's packages, I should look to see whether they've already identified and fixed it. Um, you know, update the package, the latest version and make sure that, you know, maybe they've already seen it. I'm not giving very um, precise guidance or really very many examples here about debugging, but um, here's just a quick flurry of further suggestions of debugging. Um, read before typing. So you find a bug, um, you, the natural response is to start, you mean you've identified where the problem is, the natural response is to start hacking away at it and try to fix it. Um, I'd say best usually is first to read the code that's there carefully before you start hacking away at it. That, that, um, we want to start acting, but often it's worthwhile just sitting and reading and thinking. Um, and you can you can um, get to the you can get to the solution more quickly, potentially by just really looking carefully at the code that you've written. Um, examining the most recent change, like it, what it, you know, what did you do last, um, is really the the place to start in trying to find a bug. Looking for familiar patterns, like we each, I think, have our own particular idiosyncrasies about kinds of bugs that you that will show up. I think I've mentioned to you before, I often will write a loop that's like for i equals one to n, and then write a bunch of code, and then later on, write, start a, a second loop and forget that I'm already inside a loop, and I'll do for i equals one to n again not realizing that I'm already in a, in a loop over that same index variable i. Um, so that's something that I do a lot. And so probably the first thing I should look for is have I, you know, is have I made that mistake? Because I make it a lot. Um, study the numerology of failures. The, the idea here is, you, you know, You've, you've um, tried a bunch of examples and got failures of different kinds, sort of, you know, thinking about the numbers that are coming out, um, does, does it give you any clues as to the nature of the underlying problem? Um, when, you know, when you're spending a lot of time and having to look at a lot of different things to find a bug, it, it starts to be important to keep records of what you've done so that you're really sort of spanning this, so that you're not repeating yourself a bunch of times um, in, a, in, you know, unnecessarily. And when, when all that fails, it's, it may be good to just try implementing the code a second time. The process of sitting down and trying to write the, write the function a second time may lead you to identify, ah, I see what I see what I was missing, or um, you know, often this is a, a way to to find like really per, pernicious bugs. And in summary. Um, you know, reproducibility has been a major theme of this course is all about, you know, can, you know, can you get the same answers? You know, same data, same code, will you get the same answers? And it doesn't get at, do you get the right answers? The way to tell whether your software actually works is by testing it. Um, Try it out 
um, and see whether the output matches what you'd expect. Mo you know, just as it's best to write small functions that do tight things, I think most of your, your effort in testing should be on those individual functions and making sure that they're giving the right answers. Um, once you've written tests, um, you know, you've tried out the function with some inputs, you want to save and automate those tests. And the best way to do that is with this test that, just to have your code be within the context of a package and to use the test that package to have um, organized and automated tests of, of, of each of your functions. In Python, um, the best way to test Python code is to make the, is to you know, write, it, write functions, put them into modules, and then use either the um, sort of this, the standard unit test um, framework for Python, or I think there's a, there's a module called nose tests that a lot of people use that has a lot of similarity to the test that package, um, but specific for Python. Checking the inputs of functions is really the, the first line of defense to make sure that the, that, I mean, to help you to identify the misuse of these functions, but then for each, for each function, write some unit tests, and then ultimately write some larger sort of regression tests to, to check that um, functions are working well together. And that, you know, whenever you find a bug, turn bugs into tests. You, it, when, if you identify a situation where your code is not giving the right answers, um, before you do anything else, first reproduce the bug in the minimal way possible and turn that sort of reproducible example into a test. Once you've done that, then start actually trying to resolve the problem. Any questions at all? Feel free to, to write questions in the, the chat area or turn on your mic and, answer, and, and ask questions out loud. I will, I will stop the recording. <laughs>